Okay, thanks for being back for this second uh, lecture. That is also uh, included in what we could uh, call applications of uh, micrometeorology. And now we are talking about frost protection and that is based on the chapter by Melo Abreu, Villalobos and Mateo. It's chapter 29 of the book. And in fact, the, this chapter was also based on the manual of FAO called Frost Protection, Fundamentals, Practice and Economics that was written by Rick Snyder of UC Davis and Jose Paulo and Melo de Abreu from University of Lisboa. Well, the climatologic definition of frost is the occurrence of fair temperatures below equal or below zero degrees at a height uh, from 125 to 2 meters inside a shelter. Remember, we already said that the air temperature within the shelter is not equal to crop temperature, and the difference sometimes can be important. Many times people have used the so-called frost-free period to characterize a given location in terms of frost probability. The frost-free period is the time from the last frost in the spring to the first frost in the autumn. So it gives you an approximate idea of the length or the duration of the year where conditions are suitable for agricultural uh, operations. The frost-free period is whole year round, it's 365 days in tropical areas, but the main agricultural areas of the world are in, in areas where the frost-free period goes from 8 to 10, 11 months, going from 12 to 40 degrees in latitude. And within these areas, many times, horticultural and fruit crops have to be protected against frost. In northern latitudes, we have frost-free periods going from six, only six to eight months, up to 50 degrees, and crop species are limited. We cannot grow many crop species. In locations with less than three months of frost-free period, basically we cannot produce food crops. The effect of frost on crops is not easy to predict because the frost damage is depend, depends on many factors. Here we have a list of factors affecting the effect of frost on crops and I have indicated the level of importance using three stars for the most important and only one star for the less important. You see that species is extremely important in terms of defining frost damage. Cultivar is of minor importance. The degree of acclimation to cold conditions, to frost, is very important. The state of plant tissues, that is determined by the stage of development and water and nutritional status, is of intermediate importance. The height of the canopy and the type of pruning is of minor importance. The rate of temperature decrease is of intermediate importance as the duration of the frost. And the minimum canopy temperature achieved is of the major importance. So we see that the species, the degree of acclimation to frost, and the minimum temperature achieved in the crop are the main factors affecting the frost damage. 
Another important idea about frost is that frost damage occurs only below zero degrees, typically between minus one to minus 20, and even more in some cases. Some plants are especially resistant to frost down to less than 100 degrees. The less we can have less frost damage using the avoidance or due to the avoidance of freezing or due to tolerance. The avoidance of freezing means that freezing will not occur and that is due either to the presence of solutes that lower the freezing point as you already know from general chemistry but also if we don't have freezing nuclei then temperature of water can be reduced several degrees below zero without freezing occurring. Then, if freezing occurs, we can have tolerance when the cells recover after thawing. So freezing occurs, there is some effect on the tissue, but the cells will be recovering afterwards. The freezing process starts in the intercellular spaces. Those have lower solute concentration. Then the water potential as ice crystal start to appear in the intercellular spaces. The water potential will decrease outside the cells. If the water potential outside decreases, then there will be a flow of water from the, proto uh, from the protoplast to the intercellular spaces. In other words, there is a loss of water from the cells. Therefore, there will, there will be a shrinkage of the cells and, in, and an increase of solute concentration inside the protoplast. If the increase in solute concentration is very high, then there will be a dehydration of the protoplast and that causes denaturation of nuclear proteins and therefore to cell death. In many times or in many occasions, the main damage from frost is due to the mechanical injury of ice form in the intercellular spaces. As far as we know, intracellular freezing does not occur in natural conditions. To characterize the damage from frost, we define the critical damage temperature, T crit, as the maximum temperature that results in frost injury to a plant organ when the time of exposure is longer than 30 minutes. More recently, the concept has been extended to a specific levels of injury. So we call about a T sub 90 that would correspond to 90% loss of something in the plant, for instance, 90% loss of the flowers of a tree. Or T sub 10 would mean 10% loss of flowers, fruits, or anything. To predict frost damage is not easy. In other words, uh, for several reasons but in special because the critical temperature changes during the rest periods of trees or plants in general critical temperature is very low after bud burst 
the beginning of the screen of this uh, spring the uh, critical temperature slowly approaches its upper limit and then it will be rather high during the remainder of the growing cycle during active growth when growth is occurring the critical temperature is rather high so we have very low critical temperatures during rest periods when growth is not occurring and rather high critical temperatures when growth is occurring during the rest period there is a process called hardening or acclimation to low temperatures that in, includes the reduction of t crit as a response to a continued low temperature so during the autumn typically the trees get used to low temperatures gradually and that is a hardening or acclimation process that means that after one month or two months of cold temperatures the critical temperature of the buds of the tree will be very low the problem with hardening is that it is a reversible process so the hardening may occur in response to high temperatures in general after flowering there is no hardening process so after flowering usually the secret is rather high this is the variation of the critical temperature for bad kill in cherry trees in the state of washington you see that in the late winter the critical temperature for 90 percent kill is around minus 15. as time goes by and we start spring the critical temperature increases to around minus four for 90 percent kill and the difference between the temperature for 10 percent and 90 percent kill is reduced you see that then from then on the critical temperature is more or less constant in most cases we have to be worried about frost damage occurring around flowering for vegetable and fruits the critical temperature goes from minus minus 0.4 to minus around three degrees below zero. In crops of tropical origin, the critical temperature goes from zero to minus two degrees. You can see, uh, see tables in the book that shows for different crops. This is only this is only piece of the table that you can find in the book where for the different species the critical temperature for frost is shown for different stages or conditions hardened or unhardened for instance for alfalfa the table indicates a critical temperature of minus six for unhardened crops that would mean that if you have minus six at the start of the autumn when no hardening has occurred the alfalfa crop could be killed by minus six temperature. If you have hardened the crop by low temperatures during the autumn, the critical temperature goes down to minus 14. In the case of barley, during tillering, during the tillering stage, for hardened crops, the critical temperature goes from minus 13 to minus. 17 which is rather low close to flowering the barley critical temperature is minus one minus two so it is not too far from zero 
in the table that you can find in the book, you will you can find data for other crop species. Here in this table, you see an example of the variation in the critical temperature for different stages of the buds of apple trees, going from silver tip to post bloom conditions. After first bloom, which is flowering, the start of flowering, the critical temperature for 10% kill is around 2, 3 below zero. But around 4 degrees would mean 90% kill of the flowers. This table shows the variation in the critical temperature for grapevines before bud break, first swell, just, just before bud break, we have minus 10.6 for 10% kill of the buds to minus 19 for 90% kill of the buds. So you see that the buds of grapevines before bud break are quite resistant to low temperature, to frost. But as bud burst, when bud burst occurs, 10% kill now has minus four as critical temperature. And when we are at the fourth leaf stage, when we have already had vegetative growth, we have minus 2.8 for 90% kill. So even with temperatures of minus three, minus four, could cause uh, leaf loss, leaf, uh, complete leaf loss uh, for grapevines. So it is critical to avoid very early bud break in grapevines if we are during a period where the risk of frost is still important. Sometimes we have used a classification of frost according to the, or the cost of the frost. We, we use the terms radiation frost, which is caused by long wave radiation losses, and those occur during clear, dry, and calm nights when we have a strong inversions of temperature. And advection frosts, which are those associated with the coming of very cold winds. Look at this radiation frost occur without wind, very low wind speed, and advection frost occur associated with the strong cold winds. Radiation frost can occur after advection frost have occurred already when the wind goes calmer and the skies get clear. We also talk about white frost, also hoar frost, when we observe ice crystals appearing on top of the plants. This is due to sublimation of water vapor, uh, well, to the deposition of crystals that might uh, occur directly on top of the plants. So it requires a rather high vapor pressure in the air. When the air is very dry, there will be an effect on the plant tissues that will wilt and necrose. So it, they will appear as uh, dark. That's why we call about black frost. But this is a symptom of damage already having occurred. While white frost is just a symptom that uh, the damage has not yet occurred. As I said, radiation frost are associated with strong temperature inversions. If we measure the temperature profile above the crop. Here we have an apple orchard in Braganza, Portugal. 
this is about the height of the trees and we see that early in the night this is the temperature inversion already developing as time goes by this is uh, this is 22 hours this is one uh, one at night and this is two at night when we have the strongest inversion typically the strongest inversion will be occurring close to sunset to sunrise excuse me and the higher the losses of uh, of long wave radiation the stronger the inversion that we will measure on top of the crops the wind speed also affects strongly the temperature close to the crop in this graph we see the wind speed this red line excuse me this black line during the night from sunset to sunrise during a winter night in Spear in 2012. We see also the temperature as the red line. And you can see that when we have the wind, very low wind, of the wind has stopped completely, like here during this period, the temperature of the air drops importantly. Why? Because when we have more wind, the air mixes and the temperature inversion breaks. And if the wind, if the temperature, if the air mixes, then we will have warmer air from above going to the surface. So we, we can uh, keep the temperature from falling more. If we look at this, this is an increase in temperature and this is caused to an increase in wind speed. So decreases in wind speed are associated to decreases in temperature during frost nights. The occurrence of the, fro of the first and the last frost is quite variable from year to year. You see here, the dates counting um, the dates of the first and the last the first frost in the autumn and the last frost in the spring the red uh, line and this is the first frost in the autumn the black line we see a lot of variability in the different to give you a reference this is november the first and this is April 1st. You see that typically in Cordoba, the first uh, frost will occur uh, 90 days after September the 1st, which is the scale, the scale that we are using here. In other words, one month after one of uh, November the 1st, around December the 1st could be, is about the first frost in Cordoba. And you see that in this period from 1960 to 2012, there were never frost after April the 1st. This variability can be used to calculate the probability of frost for different periods. To do that, we can consider that the date of the first frost or the date of the last frost follow normal distributions. Therefore, to calculate the probability of frost after a given day, we can calculate it as the product of pi, which is the fraction of years when frost occurs, multiplied by the probability of a variable belonging to the normal zero one z greater than the date, the time that we are considering, date t, minus the mean date 
of the last frost divided by the standard deviation of the date of the last frost. To use this equation, we can we have always to use the a similar scale, and I advise to start counting from September the first. So we count dates starting on September the first. The same applies to the probability of frost before a given day in um, in in the autumn. This was for the last frost. And this is before a given day in the spring. We apply the same equation, but now the probability will be before it was the probability set greater than this ratio. And now to calculate the probability of set lower than this ratio. And to do that, we need to calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the dates of the first frost or of the last frost. Like in this table. In this table, we have 10 years of data and we have determined what is the date of the first frost in the autumn, counting from September the 1st. And one year we have 115 and so on. So there were two years that were we had no frost in Cordoba. Some years we have no frost at all. So the first parameter that we need to do the calculations is the frequency of years with frost. In this case, is 80% of the years have some frost. In other words, P sub y is equal to 0 0.8. Then we can calculate, for instance, the probability of frost after March the 1st is, this is day 182 after 1 of September. So the probability of frost after day 181 is equal to 0 0.8, which is the frequency of years with frost, multiplied by the probability of set being greater than 181, probability of 181 minus the average from this table. This is the average and this is the standard deviation. 100, excuse me, uh, we are using, uh, yeah, for the last frost is 154 and 32.8. and 32.8. The probability of set being greater than that is equal to one minus the probability of set being less than this ratio, which is 0 0.82. And now we need to use the standard normal distribution, the normal 0, 1. And with a table like this, we can calculate the probability, for instance, the probability of set being less than 0 0.82, we go to 0 0.8 in this column and 0 0.02, which means 0 0.8 plus 0 0.02, 0 0.82, and we come to this value, 0 0.79. Therefore, 0 0.8 multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.79 is equal to 0 0.17. So for this location, the probability of having a frost after March the 1st is only 17%. You will have to calculate this probability for your location using this equation. You have all the data that you need to do that. Okay. To understand how we can uh, how we can fight against frost damage or prevent frost damages, we can use this very simple model that was proposed by Brunt 
a long time ago that considers the surface the uh, surface cooling of the surface of a soil after sunset considering first that there is no much evaporation or sensible heat losses during the night considering also that at the time of sunset the soil has a vertical temperature profile and considering those assumptions the, the reduction in temperature from sunset onwards is given by this equation the drop in temperature after sunset will be equal to this is a constant this is p one over the square root of k by cv k is the soil thermal conductivity and cv is the specific heat of soil and this this square root of the product is the so-called thermal admittance if you don't remember what it is i advise you to go and have a look at chapter six in the book this is a very interesting property thermal property of soils but according to this equation the decrease in temperature during a frost night is inversely proportional to the thermal admittance thermal admittance is low for sandy dry till soils and is high for clay or wet or compacted soils so when we have a dry sandy soil if we have a very low value for this then the drop in temperature will be important so the cooling over a sandy soil will be stronger than on a clay soil we see also that here we have net radiation net radiation is negative during the night so the more loss of long wave radiation the more the cooling during the night and also we have here the square root of time so as t increases the cooling will increase so longer nights mean greater cooling of the soil so we will have greater cooling when we have greater radiation losses when we have a smaller thermal admittance, for instance, sandy, dry, or tail or till soils, and, we, and when we have longer nights. This equation, being so simple, gives us an idea about the frost protection methods that we can use. In principle, we can have or we should apply preventive passive or indirect methods why because they are cheaper and they will try to minimize or to avoid the occurrence of frost so these are methods that are applied before the occurrence of frost then in a specific situations when we can afford it we might apply an active or direct or protective method but these are more uncommon because of the high cost in many situations we will apply both we will try to apply preventive methods before the occurrence of frost and occasionally a direct or active method this is an example of what happens with the uh, orography affecting frost damage this is a, a picture of an orange orchard where you can see that the lower parts of the orchard have been almost killed by frost and you see that the upper part of the orchard show almost no damage this event was associated with the temperatures that you can find 
here. In 2012, in February, we uh, went through a period where temperatures were minus five, below minus five on the 12th and minus 7.4 on the 13th. Then the following day, we almost reached minus five in this specific location. So first of all, we need to uh, select the location, the species, and the cultivars suitable to, for our conditions. So do not ever use for a sensitive crop a location in the orchard where cool air might accumulate, as the uh, example that we saw before. So try to match species and cultivar to the local climate. It is also advisable to delay pruning in winter because plants are more sensitive and pruning promotes bud burst. So try to delay pruning. If we have to choose, try to prune to uh, have a plant architecture that promotes taller branches to avoid uh, lower branches closer to the soil where temperatures will be lower in nights where strong inversions are formed. In some occasions, uh, it is good to remove the ice nucleating active bacteria. Those are common bacteria that can act as freezing nuclei and therefore they are unwanted. We can perform that by removing weeds in the orchard during the autumn. We can do several things to improve the conditions of the orchard before the frost period. We might try to improve, to increase the thermal admittance. And we can do that by irrigating or by compacting the soil. On the contrary, if we want to prevent frost, we should not till the soil if some frosts are predicted. Why? Because tilling the soil reduces the book density and reducing the book density reduces the thermal admittance. We can also improve the thermal conditions in orchards, for instance, by increasing the radiation reaching the soil during the daytime. To do that, we should avoid opaque mulches or cover crops. So the presence of cover crops during the winter, although it is good for controlling soil erosion, increases the risk of frost. The same goes for opaque mulches. Why? Because they prevent the soil from heating during the daytime. To increase the ratio of soil heating and sensible heat heating, in other words, to increase soil heating, we can make the surface more smoother. To do that, we can compact the surface. In other words, or contrary, if we till the soil, we will have a more rough surface and the heating of the soil will be reduced. In summary, if you want to prevent frost from occurring, avoid tillage. And the use of irrigation to increase thermal admittance has the limitation that during some time, part of the energy will go to evaporating water from the soil surface, Therefore, the soil heating will be reduced. So the optimum conditions is when we 
irrigate in advance of frost. So we have an upper soil which is dry, but the soil is wet, so it has a high admittance. As we said, the possibilities that we have for improving protection are given by this equation. We have already discussed this term, improve the thermal admittance to reduce the cooling during the night. But we can also affect the net radiation. How we do in other words, the losses of long wave radiation. To do that, we can use water spray, but to do that, we need to use droplets between 8 and 12 microns. In the past, the smoke was used to try to block losses of long wave radiation but by burning tires or wood or fuel. But this is really used nowadays because it is not efficient due to the small diameter of the particles it vanishes rapidly it has a high energy cost and worst of all it creates pollution problems nowadays you can find some rather expensive alternatives to use solid acid clouds or, or aerosols that you produce in the form you can also use thermal blankets to block the losses of long wave radiation. This is an example of an artificial fog to control frost. And this is the case of using a thermal blanket that you put on top of your plants to protect them. We already said that air has an important, the wind has an important effect on frost occurrence, on the occurrence of a temperature inversion. If we have a strong inversion of temperature and we mix the air above with the air close to the crop, then the crop temperature will be improved. To do that, we can use wind machines like here, like the one to the right, this is a tall tower with a huge, uh, a huge, uh, um, a huge fan that has diameters between three and five meters, and the height of the of these towers are around ten meters, and they move wind downwards to force the mixing of the air above and the air close to the plants. So that improves <coughs> the temperature of the crop. And this is the cheapest uh, alternative that we can use. In the past, there were several people that promoted the use of this machine that I advise to never use because it is based on wrong principle, on wrong physical principles. Look that, consider that in this case, we are forcing air going from upper uh, higher temperatures to lower temperatures so we mix the temperature air temperature profile is mixed in this case the proposal is to use a fan inside this machine to force cold wind uh, excuse me cold air going upwards the problem is that when you do that the cold air will raise a little bit and then it will go back. So you will just be circulating cold wind in the lower layers of the atmosphere. So basically, this alternative is not advisable. This is an example of using a wind machine in terms of the air temperature profile. Yeah, we have plotted temperature versus height, and we have the profile before starting the wind machine, you see a very strong uh, inversion. And six minutes after the starting of the wind machine, this is the profile that you can observe. The profile has almost gone 
uniform with height. Another alternative is adding energy to the air layers close to the canopy. And we can do that by burning fuel, solid, liquid, or gas in heaters between the crop. Those heaters will transfer energy by thermal radiation and also by convection. And the input from heaters typically requires between 140 and 280 watts per square meter, which means that they are very they have a very low efficiency and the expense in energy is quite high. The best conditions for using artificial heating of the air is when we have no wind and we have a very strong inversion. And the best conditions will be uh, obtained by using many heaters with a low power. In general, what happens is that we, when air is heated around the heaters, the air will rise until it reaches a height <coughs> where the temperature of the air rising is equal to the temperature of the air around. So at that height, the air will stop. That creates a kind of lead that prevents the heat from going, from being lost to the upper atmosphere. That will occur in proportion to the inversion that we have. That we have. So the stronger the inversion, the more efficient the heaters will be. If we have two strong heaters, then the heat will be lost to the upper atmosphere. To provide active frost protection, we can also use irrigation because we have, uh, we can release heat by water cooling and then we release 4.18 joules per uh, Kelvin per kilogram and, excuse me, kilojoules per uh, Kelvin per kilogram and by water freezing that releases 0.33 megajoules per kilogram of water frozen. In any case, some heat may be spent in evaporation, so this is not 100% efficient. To do, to apply that, we typically use a sprinkler irrigation systems, but they have typically lower application rates than normal irrigation sprinkler irrigation systems typically around one millimeter per hour the idea is that we need to be applying water slowly to keep always some water being frozen all the time and normal irrigation systems of for sprinkler irrigation are above four millimeters per hour of application rate This is a photo with a sprinkler systems. This is a commercial system for protecting vineyards, the so-called pulsator. And this is a sprinkler in, in a blueberry plantations. We said already that we talk about white frost when ice crystals are observed on top of the plants. This is lettuce in Spain. And this is a white frost in wheat. And this is frost damage in garlic. This is typical. You typically see many times some frost damage during the winter in garlic. The tips of the leaves have dried down. And this is chilling injury in maize. We see some brownish colors and typical tip burns. We generally talk about chilling injury when the injury is or the damage comes from temperatures not below zero degrees. And this is frost damage in apple flowers. This is a case of a 
uh, orange tree that uh, I found in Spiel. It was amazing to that this was the only orange tree that you could find in the in the whole town. And after a heavy uh, frost uh, in the 2000s, it com it went completely defoliated and the tree died. 